Yeah, <clears throat> our chief scientist, Ethan Allen, wow. And I love these shows. Uh, today, it's all about likable science, which is originally Ethan's show. Um, and it's today, it's all about AI, artificial intelligence, and its potentials for good and evil. And wow, this is important. I hope you're taking notes. Hi, Ethan. Hey, Jay, how are you doing? You know, I was uh, was watching a video uh, on YouTube about uh, the the the, uh, the race we have with China and uh, on AI, AI, and it's so interesting. It's different than the race we have with Russia. Russia is not nearly as advanced as the U.S. is, and China is catching up. They claim to you know be over, able to overtake us by 2030. Um, and and I think they will because they're putting so much time and effort into AI. But what people don't understand, okay, is what it can do. And I know you've been thinking about that. What can it do, Ethan? I think maybe the question these days is what can't it do? <laughs> I mean, it can do an amazing array of things that we thought not possible for technology to do a few years ago. Um, an amazing array of really great, wonderful, powerful things. Um, you know, in the world of medicine, AI can can take away a bunch of uh, sort of tedious work of scanning images for very small discrepancies. So finding tumors before they grow, uh, all that kind of stuff. And it can do it faster and better than, than our, our best human scanners. Um, it, it can uh, make... Uh, business industrial process is much more efficient by, by seeing patterns that, again, we, are, we don't see because of all the complex multifaceted parts, the supply chains, the, the bottlenecks in transportation and storage and human relation, uh, human resources. You know, we can take all those factors and put them all together and, and figure out the best algorithms for it. But on the other hand, <laughs> it gets used in some very not so good ways. Um, uh, the, the big one that I see these days is in uh, the People's Republic of China, where particularly in the Western provinces, they're using it very much for a so social control aspect, where they gather data from people and they have cameras all around, they're doing facial recognition, everyone has to carry their ID card, they have to use that for transactions, they have to use that for anything they do, basically. All this data is fed into massive database and AI basically looks at this stuff and says, hmm, this person's changed their pattern. They, they're leaving by the back door of their house now. They, used, they were leaving by the front door all the time. I wonder why this is. You know, are they doing something they, sh they don't want you to know about? I mean, it, it gives this unprecedented level of control. And it's, and it's frightening because, you know, uh, this kind of technology was credited with, with basically we're supposed to really open things up and, and democratize the world and, and give us all the power. And unfortunately, authoritarians seem to have usurped that to some extent. Yeah, I mean, any any self-respecting authoritarian is going to use the technology. I mean, Adolf Hitler did at the time and all that propaganda he did. And he was using modern technology and the modern technology today is AI. So if you wanted to do surveillance and uh, facial recognition, uh, there's no question that, that, you know, that your um, advanced techniques in, that, in AI will help you do that. What is interesting though, and, and it's worth discussing, <clears throat> is that, okay, you have, you have, you have it's, it's, um, it's too, it's too, it's two places in the road, to a fork in the road. Um, if you want to be an authoritarian government, uh, of course you would you uh, use AI to squash any protest. On the other hand, if you want to be a protester, you use AI to efficiently organize your protest, like with social media and all this. So there's a tension there between one and the other. My guess, though, is that the 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 person who is putting more money into it, um, advancing AI faster than the other guy is going to win that tension. So protesters, by definition, they don't have that skill. Governments do, or they can get that skill. And at the end of the day, the old notion of changing regimes, of um, you know having uh, protesters. Um, 
you know, seek and obtain some relief, um, it's not going to work. Governments are going to be better at surveillance and what did you call it, social control, people control, than protesters are at communicating protests. Do you agree? Absolutely. And it's why our governance of AI needs to be put in place and we need to be working very hard on that. And I saw an article today that suggested the European Union is actually now essentially by their own rules going to have to dump a whole bunch of data that they have sort of inadvertently gathered or gathered without realizing they were gathering it uh, on people and that, that are under their own rules is not, they're not allowed to gather it. And good for them. I mean, good for them. That, that's, that's great. I think we need that kind of, you know, uh, sort of an, an ethical overlay on it. Uh, because I mean, right now, while I just criticize PRC, we, ha we have big corporations in the U.S. gathering amazing amounts of data and there's no not even the government controlling how they use that <laughs> so it may not be quite as bad they may not be able to call out the troops against you uh if they don't like what you're doing but they are gathering pretty much a lot of the same kind of data we don't quite have the camera arrays and, and the facial recognition stuff is widespread in this country but um yeah what's what's odd is uh maybe you can help me with this <clears throat> in an authoritarian government like china um, you know they're gathering data. You know they're, you're getting it every which way, and there's a, a huge library of data on you. You know that. Everyone, everyone in China knows that. In the U.S., we don't know that mm -hmm. because the, the custom and culture in the U.S. is you don't tell people. You just take it. You just do it. And, and it's interesting that we're so into privacy and human rights and civil rights. Uh, sometimes we pretend to be into that. We aren't really. <clears throat> but we're not as advanced in terms of the transparency of the use of AI as China is. They tell them. Everybody knows. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder when we're going to catch up on that. This is all a big you know, com competition. It's a competition. It's a multifaceted competition. It's a kaleidoscopic competition. And I don't think, you know, the average person on the street in the United States appreciates in any significant way what AI is, what it can do, and how it is affecting our life, and how it will affect our life going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's ways large and small. So recently, I, I had this slightly unnerving experience. I opened up my computer, uh, typed in someone's name, got there. This is a friend of mine. I just didn't, I was going to go to her house. So I, I needed her address, got her address out, oh, picked up my phone, clicked it on onto Google Maps. Her address was there. It was the first thing on my phone. When I, when Whoa. I, when I, <laughs> They're watching you, Ethan. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, there was some AI going on there that somehow they understood. Oh, he's looking up an address here. Well, uh, he's going to want it on his Google Maps on his phone. Even though I, you know, they were completely separate applications. And yeah, it was, it was a little, just a little like, mm. Mm, Big Brother is watching you. And, yeah. and, and although in that case, you don't mind, you know, you say, gee, that's impressive. They, they know what I want before I, I know what I want. <clears throat> it's, it's like a movie. It's like a, it's like a science fiction movie all around you. Um, so, you know, a bunch of things come, come to mind about this. Um, it's so smart that it makes itself smarter. Uh, it develops its own intelligence beyond where you started with it. Um, it's remarkable, you know, at the beginning, I mean, I took a little program one day, was uh, organized by Kamehameha Schools, um, and they had some technology people there from Ocean, as I remember, <clears throat> and, and, they, and they were telling us, you know, the fundamental principles of comparing images, comparing one piece of data against another. And you compare these uh, different things you're looking at at a very, very high speed with a lot of processing power. And you can make the matches. And when you make the matches, you have um, a little conclusion. And then you multiply this times a zillion, and you, you get the most remarkable computing power ever imagined in the world. And you go through hundreds of millions of comparisons in a second. And then at the end of that processing, they know a lot. 
And it, it doesn't have to be comparing face facial recognition in Tinjan, uh, Xinjiang rather. It it could be um, you know uh, comparing uh, one virus against another. It could be solving the, the mysteries of cancer. Um, it could be um, G. Uh, you know anything anything where the human brain is not capable of doing it even a group of people not capable of remaining rational cool calm collected and making those zillions of comparisons so this suggests to me something i've thought about since i i started practicing law you could have a little black box that would make legal decisions it could look at every precedent you could apply the precedent you can say oh jay come on uh, you know, that's not appropriate. We are human beings and we have feelings and we have cultures and we have all of these um, human attributes. You can't let a little box tell you what the law is. Oh, really? I think it's coming. <clears throat> the other thing is you can go one step further than that and you can say, how about governing us? How about running Congress, for example, yeah. or being Congress? What about a little about that big, a little black box. Um, <clears throat> query, would that black box do better? Yes, it would. <laughs> it's got to be in the future somewhere. The problem is it's going to get there only by some dystopian process. It's not going to get there because we had a big vote around the country. <laughs> People don't understand. But one day we'll have a, we'll have a dictator, I think. That's, you know, that's the future. And a dystopian world that will follow that will be the little black box which is controlled by the autocrat. And he may be a benign autocrat, hopefully, or at least not, not, too, not too evil. Uh, but I think, I think if you can solve these problems we're talking about, you can solve any problem. And China believes, and China is investing a lot of money into AI, um, that, that, it, that, that AI will rule the world in a, in a few years, the competition will be resolved where any question I mean, for example, they want Taiwan. Okay, we know they want Taiwan. So you could put it out in a combat information center. What are our options? How do we get Taiwan? We could do this, we could do that, we could do that, and this, and we could have a time frame, and we could um, d deploy people and, and equipment and weapons and, and tell us, Mr. AI, what is the best approach and in one second, it will tell you the best approach from all that you ever knew or thought about with all of your resources. It's like a computer game, except it's real. <laughs> and it gives you an answer that presumably you can rely on. And you want Taiwan, you get Taiwan. It, I mean, it's, this is going to happen. Yes. I mean, one of the really uh, tricky issues is that AI, though, it, it typically works even in self-learning, self-teaching AI, uh, learns from data that you feed it, right? And therefore, if the data that it's fed is biased in some way, your AI learns that bias and incorporates it. And they have had a number of instances where, for instance, in facial recognition systems, they, they have come up where they clearly reflect the bias of, of the, the developers of the system and the data that they were fed. And so you would have to... I, I would be very concerned in that case that, that depending upon who's programmed the data to to take over Taiwan, you know, you're going to get the, sort of get the answer you want in some sense. Um, oh, sure. You program it, uh, you know, to be an, an autocratic government, you get an autocratic government. But let me add this stuff. The original programming, okay, can be modified by the AI itself. In other words, if the if you feed it also you know, the, the basic morality, the basic norms of a given human civilization and say, these, these are the ones you always have to look for. And then even an autocrat uh, can feed in really evil stuff, but the AI can say, no, that's, that's not right. We're, you, I can't do that for you, Hal. <laughs> I can't do that for you, Hal. Um, and then, so it's, it's what it's doing is it's, um, it's learning how to apply the norms, the morality, the ethics um, that you started out pro against somebody who might want to you know, override that. And right. so I think it, you know, it's going to develop a personality, never a consciousness. Consciousness is something that, you know, maybe that'll happen someday, maybe in our lifetime, but not yet. And so the question is, you know, 
who programs it first and who gives it that fundamental you know human set of values because you can override that if you programmed it the wrong way but if you programmed it with those values then even an autocrat you know wouldn't be able to use it because the ai would learn Right. I mean, you're, you're sort of talking about uh, Isaac Asimov's, right, the, the three laws of robotics, right? And, and, you know, the robots are not allowed to harm people. End of discussion, right? And, yeah, and good luck. Uh, <laughs> you're right. If you can imagine it, it can happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. We need to have, there should be a whole sort of training for anyone who's going into AI development on ethical use of AI and, and what kind of ethics first you instill in yourself or get instilled in yourself and then instill the same those same ethics in your AI so that the, you know, it, it, it works for good. All technologies, uh, virtually all technologies are essentially value neutral, right? They are they have no inherent good or bad. It's what use you put them to what we do with them, what we as people do. And so, yeah, trying to stack the deck so that your AI is used for good and not for evil is, is sort of the name of the game here, right? Um, yeah. I mean, by putting good people in charge of AI development by asking them to be very careful about this rather than just saying, hey, make the AI do this for us, sort of, uh, you know, and, and use an ends justifies mean kind of means argument you know at the end of the day we really have to have responsible people who are in charge of the ai i mean super responsible because there is super leverage you know um years ago a given public official he wouldn't have that much power but as time goes by and you have communications you have command control kinds of things happening um then the, the, the official has more power and, you know, the president could push a button, who knows what? I mean, it, it's the, the power is enormous, but you add to that AI and the power to control minds, the power to control public opinion, the power to control information, and plus the power to control weapons. Mm -hmm. That person is really, really powerful. Um, and that's why he has to be carefully selected. Maybe the AI should select him <laughs> or her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's the whole interesting emerging sort of related field of, uh, you know, human uh, computer interfaces, right, where it's being, being used in the medical field now to let persons who are uh, spinal cord injured, paralyzed, uh, move robotic arms by their thoughts, right? And, and so their robotic arm can reach out and, and get them a, a glass of water or, you know, help them whatever way it can. Um, just by the person thinking about doing that themselves. Um, great stuff, wonderful stuff. But this is just, it's not even Model A, Model T technology, though. I mean, this is this is pre that, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's the basic. I agree, it's peanuts compared to what can happen. Right, and what it's, will happen. Well, sorry, you're right, what will happen. So um, and China's not fooling around. They are, they are using it for everything they can, and they are building systems where they will use it for more and more things. They are very advanced. And, and although, you know, in the American style of exceptionalism, we believe we're the best sort of thing, I'm not sure we are the best, you know? The, 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 the conventional wisdom would say, we're, we're ahead. We're not ahead by much, but we're ahead. Well, how do we know that? It, it, they're spending, you know, I remember a lunch here in Honolulu um, where, and this has got to be maybe 15 years ago, where the vice mayor of Beijing was there at this lunch right here. And I said to him, you know, it's wonderful that you guys value engineering and 29% uh, of your college graduates are engineers. And that, that speaks to your view of the future. And he said, you're right, we care a lot about engineering, but it's not 29%, Fidel, <clears throat> it's 59% of our college graduates are engineers. <laughs> that was 15 years ago. Right. Now they're saying everybody's got to get into AI. <laughs> yeah, grown their scientific expertise tremendously. Uh, right now, they're still limited, that is uh, sort of ironically enough for them, uh, 
is all the, the sort of the cutting edge chips that you really need to do your AI well. Uh, essentially, many of them are produced in Taiwan. <laughs> oh, they want Taiwan. Right. Uh, but, TMSC, isn't it? Yeah, Taiwan something. And yeah, but again, that's sort of, it's, it's a nice sort of Mexican standoff in an odd way, right? Because Taiwan does not want to do that. And I'm quite convinced that they'll blow up the factories if China tries to take them by force. You know, they'll say, fine, you know, you'll, you'll get a wasteland here to get an island with a, a bunch of rubble on it, basically. And, you know, too bad, you know. Oh, what a, what a tragedy that would be for so yeah. many people and things around the world. You know, with AI, remember Andrew Yang, and you know, and he was talking about guaranteed income and all this. And well, with our technology, um, you know, we can, everyone can live without working a lot. <laughs> You know, with AI, it's possible to develop a civilization where it's all done for you. And uh, wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, now that gets to a very interesting point. And, and you sent me a link uh, earlier today or the other day uh, about how AI, unfortunately, is typically is not being used to supplement people's work and make, help them do their work better or more efficiently, but is being used to replace people. And so we have these bigger more complex jobs being done with fewer and fewer people. I was, I was shocked to read recently or hear that these monster container ships that now exist, right? Container ships that are five football fields long that stand 35 stories or 15 stories high off the water line to, to their deck, monstrous things. They run typically with a crew of about two dozen people and they can run with a crew as little as maybe a dozen people. It just, it's amazing you think of some huge thing like that that you're running and you're moving it through the oceans and, and do and you get a dozen people who are doing that i mean it's and you know you know a, a roman galley took you know hundreds of people <laughs> to <run out laughs> and you know, right and very little uh, payload <laughs> right? yeah, uh, so there's, there's this odd thing that they have not unfortunately been used to supplement people and make our lives better in every case they have kicked people out of jobs they are indeed exacerbating the inequity in our society to some extent. There are the people who work with the machines who are doing pretty well, and then there are people who you know, have lost their jobs because their part of the manufacturing chain is now being done by the machine. Uh, yeah, but Andrew Yang would say, okay, all right, they lost their jobs, but we have the ability to take care of them. You know, uh, the humane thing to do, but we have the power to do that. And we can feed them, we can clothe them, we can provide housing uh, for them. We can do all of that using this very special intelligence uh, that we have. And so, you know, it ultimately falls on government and government is an expression one way or the other of public opinion. Um, and, and I feel that government and public opinion are way behind where we could be. You know, in fact, uh, talk about good and evil, uh, although Russia is not nearly as advanced as the US or China uh, in terms of AI. They use it for nefarious reasons. They're collecting data. They're using the data to try to twist public opinion, twist votes. Uh, you know, Cambridge Analytica was working with them or for them or something. Um, and the Internet Research Agency is busy, busy, busy trying to control every election in every state and the federal system in the US right now. And we are really not able to stop them. Um, and so they, how do they do that? Well, it's very interesting. It's, and it's, I'm sure it's done with AI. Let me tell you a short story I read recently about movies on, I think it's Twitter. So you see a little clip, okay? You like the clip. You stay around for 10 seconds, 15 seconds. It's making a record of that. It knows you like that clip. Mm -hmm. Okay, next time it's going to present to you another movie on the same subject. It's like that weird thing with Google Earth, right? It knows you. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's going to evaluate your taste and your maybe your political position too. And it's gonna set it's gonna put you in a bubble if it wants. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's what the Internet Research Agency is doing. <clears throat> they don't care who's right and wrong, they just want to divide the country. Right, right. And, and they do this by putting you in a bubble that seems appropriate for what you are reading and thinking and watching. And um, I mean, it's not it's not rocket science, but it is using AI. And so I think they have done a lot to create the division in our country. And they're trying to do more of it because, if you know, it's the new kind of war. It's yeah. AI war. 
Um, and if they can divide us all, they can neutralize us as a, as a great power. Yeah, I, I would, I think, I guess I would characterize it more as it, it's the new generation of information ops, you know, uh, instead of just you know, showering out propaganda, you now you create the truth. I mean, the, the, the classic movie, Wag the Dog, right? I know. Know, this is becoming all too real that, that we are able to create the illusion of reality. And since we live in a world sort of this post-truth world where nobody really seems to care much about what really is the truth, uh, if you can get a good engaging story that sounds like it might be true, and particularly if, if it then gets some people really good and angry, it'll spread like wildfire. Everyone will believe it, or enough people will believe it. It's truth value no longer counts, sort of. And that's only with AI now being able to start manipulating images in incredibly sophisticated ways. So if, if you know, somebody has takes some think tech clips, watches you for about 20 seconds on, the, on this clip, and they can then fairly quickly and easily extract you, make you appear to be saying anything they want you to be saying, making any gestures they want you to be making. Uh, and that a few years ago, it, that was possible, but that was a big, complex, expensive thing to do. Now, as I understand it, there are, there are sort of, essentially there are apps you can buy to do that and you can buy them fairly cheaply. Uh, this is a frightening thing. This is just gonna degrade our, our the, the, the world of truth you know and it's just all of it's already happening oh it's happening and, and but it's uh, the pace of it is accelerating in, in an ugly way now and it's getting into realms where it's going to become more and more difficult you know? yeah, yeah and you lose you 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 become um you lose your ability to do critical thinking it, you're, it's taken away from you somehow because you're infected may i use that term infected um by this stuff that's thrown at you it's out of a novel well, I think what's interesting, and you pointed it out a couple of times here today, is that this is the intersection of, of, of science, uh, call it data science, right, and, and social science. Um, and when, the, when this machine, this uh, AI machine, creates a story that it wants you to believe, that it sends to you because it, it thinks you're vulnerable to get into that bubble, it's not accidental. It's not like some kid in the Internet Research Agency in Moscow is designing the story. AI is designing the story. It's got a bunch of options. What do we take? What do we tell Jay Fidel today that he will believe? And they know enough about me and about you know the world I live in to create a story that's completely believable. Right. And that's the magic. Yeah. If they know, for instance, what makes you angry. And they know that you'll tend to resend things that make you angry. Then, hey, you know, they'll they'll send you stuff to make you know to make you angry in the way they want you angry, to make you angry at the things they want you to be angry at. And uh, know that essentially they will have just been it will not have only infected you, as it were. They you will now go off and infect a lot of other people, right? Because you're an influential guy, you know. So it, yeah, it it is very hard. I, I would take issue with the fact that it doesn't. I would argue it does not destroy critical thinking or even degrade it. It forces us to be more critical, more critical thinkers. It forces us to hone those skills, to use them to the best of our ability, to not believe necessarily what we see, to, to think carefully about why we're seeing that. Where did that come from? Who might have sent that for what reason? You know, and what is the evidence that supports it? What are the what's the context it's being presented in? What are Counter examples to it that might suggest it's not true, uh, you know, forces us to, to uh, and if we don't do that, and unfortunately there's no evidence that people do much of that anymore, uh, yes, then it's, you know, I, I, I'm not optimistic for the future. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I want to get to that, but uh, let me just uh, just throw the, the name Fox News on the table here. Fo Fox News is able to convince people of things that are untrue. Mm -hmm. By the millions, you know, by the tens of millions and people, you know, seriously believe what Fox News tells them, even though a critical thinker would say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense at all. And yet they buy into it. So I think 
you know, it's a demographic issue. If I give you a country of 330 million people, and I say, well, you know, maybe 40% of them are capable of, of critical thinking, and they will be very mm, careful and paranoid about any kind of input from any media. I said, good, you know, uh, good for them. Their training, their education was good, and their, what do you want to call it? Their, their ability to do critical thinking is good. But if the rest are unable to do that for any reason or don't want to do it and fall into this vulnerability, this bubble thing, um, gee whiz, uh, we're, we're sunk. And the notion of dem democracy really is based on critical thinking, the individualism of, you know, the early exceptional U.S., where people would actually um, talk to each other personally, argue with each other, take issue, um, and come to some kind, I don't want to say consensus, but at least, um, you know, some kind of critical thinking experience. Um, I, don't, I don't think that happens anymore. You get in your bubble, you stay there. Yeah, I, 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 I hate to agree with you, but I, but I am. Uh, to me, it, it seems, and you know, I spent most of my career in science education, and I don't understand how we've so utterly failed to teach evidence-based thinking. Uh, so many people, so many of our leaders in, you know, in Congress, in the Senate, are blatantly ignoring evidence and choosing to promote a, a viewpoint that you know, has nothing to do with reality, uh, has nothing to do with the truth, has nothing to do with the evidence that is there, uh, and just, you know, going, going down this path that they, for whatever reason, feel is appropriate. Uh, it, it's, it's very, very, very sobering. And it's, and it's a ripe uh, pomegranate for AI. It's, it's an AI. easy job for AI to create public opinion out of, out of thin air. Yeah, it feeds into all of our psychological biases. And we all have these biases. We all, you know, sort of want to have things that, that resonate with us that, that reinforce our existing beliefs. You cannot help that. You know, you want to, uh, you will think that arguments that coincide with your own beliefs and, and wishes are better arguments than those that don't. I mean, just... You know, these are our human biases that they are there and that, you know, we're, we're wired that way in our brains. Uh, yeah. And we need to be aware of that. We, we all need to sort of, again, watch out for it in a very critical thinking sort of metacognitive way, right? Yeah. Why well, I it's like it's, the human condition has always had the, the devil and the, and, uh, the, devil and the angel uh, advising each person. And that's and that's what we have here, except that it's just uh, you, you're more vulnerable now because there are more there's more noise coming at you and you could pick the wrong route. So what's interesting, and I, I want to close with this and ask you a hard question. <laughs> so on the one hand, you have the devil. On the other hand, you have the angel. On the one hand, you have somebody who's solving medical problems, doing remarkable science, remarkable, unbelievable science you would not have imagined when you studied years ago and, and took your degrees. Um, and, um, uh, you know, this will un undoubtedly for its, its side of the equation, um, it will make our lives better in terms of the medicine, the communication, um, uh, manufacturing, where an individual can have an Andrew Yang kind of life, <laughs> where somebody takes care of him. Um, and, and maybe it could even improve government if it, if it got into the right position. Okay, on the other side, there are people who would like to muck up public opinion, who would like to tell you lies and set it up so you believe the lies, uh, who would like to use this as weapons, uh, even weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and they're not the same person. And, you know, the fellow on the one side, he's a, he's a good, decent human being and with morality. On the other side, not the same person. And he's interested in destruction. Um, okay. And so, uh, the, but the one thing they have in common is AI. That's what they have in common. <laughs> including governments, rogue government versus, you know, democratic government, all that. So my question to you is, <clears throat> in the fullness of time, and that may be coming quickly because AI accelerates time, it ac accelerates the human experience into moments, seconds, nanoseconds, okay? <clears throat> Which one will prevail? Which one will, will govern, define our future, Ethan? Well, 
Well, let me just step in about you, you. I love that analogy of you've got your angel and you've got your devil in the classic sort of way we, we've all seen those images. In this day, in this era of information overload, it's as if you have actually several angels sitting there on your shoulder, your, your own internal ones and, and some external ones too. But now you've got this massive crowd of devils, <laughs> you know, your own demons, but tons and tons and tons of, of other ones. So all this noise and, and you know, are you, which, which are you going to lean to? Which are you going to go with? Again, I'm an optimist. I, I ultimately believe we will work as human beings to do good. We will, our technology will ultimately help us. But I suspect we may be in some very rough patches before we get to that utopia. Utopia versus dystopia. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan Allen, our chief scientist, wrestling today with the, the morality, the norms, the ethics of science in general, but especially now when it is coming at us so fast. Thank you, Ethan. I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you, Jay. I, I agree totally. Aloha.